Um, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Peter Coffey, who comes to us from a, a distinguished career of journalism and has now the director of platform research at Salesforce. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, in the coveted after lunch slot. <laughs> Every time I do an event in consecutive years, I go ahead and put together the material I'd like to share and then quickly do a precautionary check on what did I say a year ago. If I'm going to contradict it, that's interesting. If I'm going to reinforce it, that's cool, but I don't want to duplicate it. I'm relieved to be able to tell you that this year when I put together a talk based on the title that they gave me, and the most interesting talks for me are always the ones where someone says, this is the title of the session we'd like you to present, because that definitely you know, makes me go out and ask and answer questions that otherwise might not have occurred to me. Um, it, was, it was actually not necessary for me to, to remove anything redundant. Essentially, everything I said last year is really now just foundation and won't even be m mentioned explicitly for the things that, that we're going to be sharing this year. The, the sessions this morning really made some key points that, that I really want to amplify on today, which is that platform is not a technical term. If you're at the layer where your customer feels, yeah, I can add some differentiating value at that level, that makes you a platform. If you're too far below that level, you're just plumbing. And if you're above that level, then you're a competing application. The level at which people say, yep, I, I don't really feel there's a lot of room for, for differentiating value add down there, well, that by definition ought to be a platform. Oddly enough, the first time I heard the word used in any way other than an architectural, you know, physical, civil engineering way was by a naval officer who referred to a guided missile destroyer as a platform. Because he, he, from his point of view, it was a container on which you put weapons and guidance systems and then went off to fight a war. He didn't want to think about building hulls, didn't particularly want to think about building engines, but was very interested in how he was going to add value on that to, to execute new and evolving missions. And if we can get beyond the idea that a platform is what its vendor says it is, in particular, I have, I have mentioned many times our history of being a platform provider is that we did not dare to use the P word until we had customers come to us and say they were starting to treat us as one and would we kindly step up to the obligations that that implied of providing tooling, of providing education, of, of building out our APIs so that they could stop having to struggle to add value to us and rather have us act as if that was what we were there to do. But I have since harbored a, a, a deep belief that arriving in a marketplace and declaring yourself to be a platform deserves to be greeted with a sneer and a we'll be the judge of that. <laughs> Your customers will tell you when you have become a platform for them. And the coolest thing that's happened to me in the last two years is that after five years of people telling me that they only viewed us as their CRM provider, uh, I'm sorry, customer relationship management provider, uh, we were essentially viewed as a software as a service point solution, a, an internet-based version of what they were currently running in their data centers. And you would ask a few questions like, oh, well, have you ever you know, done this, done that, done this other thing? You would discover that they were speaking prose without realizing it. They were using platform capability, but did not yet think of us as a platform. Only in the last two years have I had companies like Hewlett Packard and Toyota start to refer to us kind of almost in passing, um, as if it were obvious, as a platform. And that's been a, a tremendous pivot in, in the world of us and it made, has made me think about, you know, what does it imply to become and to continue to be a platform? I don't know how many of you ever tried to build something by reading an article in Popular Electronics <laughs> with a schematic diagram, after which you would make up a little parts list, drive out to Syosset to Lafayette Radio Electronics, um, buy too many expensive things in separate packages, hope that you'd gotten it about right, and take it home and then try to figure out how to put it together. Now, if you've had to go from the level of schematic diagram to counter at Radio Shack or Lafayette to buy the parts and figure out for yourself, you know, well, what kind of cabinet am I going to use? You know, so what's the layout on the chassis going to be? Um, a Heath kit looks like a platform. There may be other people in the room besides me who've ever built one of these things. And from, from the point of view of not standing at the parts counter saying, oh, you don't have that in an electrolytic? OK, well, maybe I can use a ceramic for that. Instead, opening up, there are all the parts. They are the right parts. There's instructions on how to put it together. That's a platform. 
The problem is that too much software development today is still at the Heathkit level. The company says, hey, here are all the parts. They all work together, go for it. And that's really not a very high level at which to be adding value today. Um, at some point, of course, the components became microscopic and you did not go to the Lafayette counter and say, you know, give me a capacitor because that would be, you know, about, you know a poppy seed would hold a thousand of them, right? Okay, we stopped assembling things at the component level pretty early on, a couple of decades ago. At that point, adding value happens at the level of the chipset. Now this eventually stopped being the chipset and became the highly integrated microprocessor. Claude Leglise was the vice president at um, Intel who, when the 486 was a brand new thing, because now it had a whole bunch of stuff that used to be separate chips all in one, he looked me in the eye as an eWeek reporter and said, at this point, if you're a PC builder, you get to pick the color of the box. <laughs> all the important decisions had been made at the chipset level, and really at that point, you were just talking about cosmetic packaging. Um, and so the question of, well, how do you add value to that uh, became a very difficult one. Scott McNeely, uh, when he went as his son, said, you know, if you look at the Wintel marketplace, you know, Windows defining the soft layer, Intel defining the hard layer, it's really like being a grocer and to continue, as Scott said, really the only thing you can add to a banana is a bruise. <laughs> I'm saying, you know, really, this was a marketplace that had almost immunized itself against any meaningful innovation, people who did try to innovate on that platform would find themselves literally with a cease and desist letter from Microsoft saying, we own the visual copyright on Windows. It was like a, it was like a filmmaker saying, you can't colorize that movie without my permission. And when Hewlett Packard actually put something that wasn't a desktop interface on Windows, this actually came out in the testimony during the antitrust trial. It was found that when Microsoft said, no, 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 you can't have this tabbed page style interface. It has to boot to the desktop. That's part of our copyright on that product. The return rate of perfectly good functioning new machines to the retailer by people who simply didn't get the idea that you click on start to shut down the machine. <laughs> this, was, this was a significant dent in Hewlett Packard's retail profitability and it was a pure byproduct of the constraint on ability to innovate on Windows as a platform. It was odd. People said, well, Windows is a platform. You know, from Microsoft's point of view, it was a product. They weren't, they weren't prepared to have you change the definition of what it was, and that, in, that, in many key ways, from their point of view, it was a product, not a platform. At some point, we really stopped, as I say, thinking of hardware-level innovation as being something that was open to lots of people, and so we started innovating at the level of code. And at one point, simply putting an empty window on the screen was 120 tedious lines of C code. Um, very quickly, we reached the point where the scarcity of coding talent really became a binding constraint. This is one of the other important elements of a platform is where's the, where does the scarcity level begin to bind? When do you want to say, I'm willing to give up some flexibility and control here because I don't want to have to pay the market price for people who work at that level below what I want my platform to be. And of course, then something like Visual Basic came along. And this was a revelation, because what this thing did was take that Windows API, and if you wanted a window on the screen, you just drew the damn window. And basic behaviors like a file menu, an edit menu, you just got that. You just got that as a, as a platform capability. Well, then this thing happened where instead of islands of computation, you know, PCs with maybe a network, uh, when I joined the publication that I left in uh, 2007, it was called PC Week. When I left, it was called eWeek. When I first started, there was a supplement called NetWeek for the fraction of people whose PCs were on networks. That was special. Well, the idea that, uh, that uh, connection would ever be like this, everything connected all the time, that again changes things. And 10 years ago, I had a breakfast conversation with our chairman and CEO, I didn't work for him at the time, um, talking about the question of what do we have to do to make writing an application that runs on a global network as straightforward as writing an application that, run on, that ran on an isolated machine had come to be. Because at that point, Again, this is kind of trying to remember when you had to write code to put a window on the screen. At that point, you had to do all the work involved in building the app, then deploy it 
to a web server and wrap it in identity mechanisms. And it was a tremendous addition of complexity to make it network accessible. Now, it was interesting to see two quite different approaches to solving this problem. Sun Microsystems was still a company at the time. Well, I'm sorry, they're not a separate company anymore. They're not a separate company anymore, are they? I think they got acquired. It was in all the papers. You, you must have read about this, Marshall. Sun Microsystems was still a, a, a label. It was a brand at the time. Is anything branded Sun anymore? I don't really think I stepped in something there. And they had a Java, develop, they had a Java development product where its principal distinguishing feature is that now you could deploy an identity server with one click, deploy the app server with one click, build a whole web in a box to test your web app, and isn't this an amazing productivity step forward? And the breakfast conversation I had with, with uh, Mark Benioff was, why do I want to deploy an identity server at all? One click is one too many. I don't want to have to build a web in a box to test my app. I just want to, I just want to write the app and have it run in that environment. Well, that's kind of a leap of faith. That's kind of, I want, to, I want to be able to make one book kind of statement. I want writing an app that runs on, on the global network to be no more intrinsically complex than writing an app that would run on a single PC. And the problem is that, that the world began to demand this very quickly because forget about that little supplement called NetWeek. Ten, uh, sorry, four years ago, International Telecommunication Union did some surveys and found that four years ago, there were 14 mobile broadband connections for every 100 people on the face of the earth. I'm fairly sure that that hockey stick curve there has continued to go up, and you'll notice two things. One, it's got a heck of a slope. And two, it's leaving fixed connections way behind. People who are connected all the time behave differently from people who are connected, shall we say, episodically. For those of you who saw the movie The Social Network, which was not a documentary about the early days of Facebook, but merely suggested by characters and situations from the real story, read, read Kirkpatrick's book if you want the real story, but the young co-ed who has just slept with Justin Timberlake is referring to Facebook as being, quote, freakishly addictive, unquote, adding, I'm on it like five times a day. <laughs> five times a day? I'm not sure I'm not, I'm fairly sure I'm on Facebook an average of five times an hour. Um, or, and, and Twitter, you know, maybe two or three times a minute. I don't know. Uh, the, the question is, well, what's, the, what's it on? What is it off? It, it's, not, it's just the context in which you do stuff. Someone at Pew Research recently said, saying you're going to do it on the internet today is like saying you're going to do it on planet Earth. As opposed to where? <laughs> Try to do something that has no net connection whatsoever really difficult. It's almost a statement. I mean, we were talking about this earlier. If you really want to be off the net for a week, you'd better go backpacking because otherwise it's going to be tremendously difficult. So these numbers are, are significant in two ways. One, connection is pervasive, and two, it's mobile. And the implication of it being mobile is it's 24-7. It's, it's conversational. We've built entire models of productivity platform based on the idea that you will have a conversation with a customer today, go back to the office, work all day, and send them a letter with your answers to their five questions. Now, if you tried to have an interaction with your significant other over the breakfast table, where they talk for half an hour and you take notes, and at the end you say, OK, let me get back to you on that. I don't, no, I'm sorry. I don't think that's going to go real well. And if you try to have a conversation even of, OK, these are the things you've been talking about for the last half hour. Here, here's how I feel about that. I'm sorry, that's not natural. Platforms today must be conversational, must be collaborative, must facilitate the kinds of interaction that people carrying little pieces of magic black glass expect to have with their service providers, with their collaborators, with their customers. The device makeup is going to be different. I mean, have you ever noticed people around a meeting table with laptops who look like they're playing Battleship? They're all hiding behind their screens. Well, this is what I can see, and you can't see it, and this is what I can see. You, you, you're, you're carrying a piece of gold foil that makes sure that nobody else can see what's on your screen. Uh, the makeup of the device marketplace is such that Gartner is saying, look, you know, whatever you want to call a PC, a laptop, an ultra-mobile, desk-based, whatever, all of those combined are not going to sell 
uh, as many as, as tablets are. And tablets, for those of you who saw Apple's quarterly announcement the other day, are already a challenged category because as soon as you've got a five and a half inch screen, most people don't want to bother hauling out that great big nine inch thing. They want to, um, they, they want to work with the smartphone. And those are good, that's going to be another factor of six above the tablets. So instead of the mobile device being an accessory to the website or being an accessory to the quote real application unquote, increasingly the face of your brand, the tool of discovery of knowledge and capability in your organization is going to be something that happens on a pocket-sized, hand-sized device. And that's, it means what a platform needs to provide has to begin, that floor at which you begin to add value assumes secure, ubiquitous connectivity, assumes resilient handling of offline. These are not things you can get paid to do anymore. These are things a platform has to do for you. Apps, as I said, are not merely an accessory because number one, apps are more productive, and number two, they are actually now dominant. As of January of this year, more US citizens get stuff done online through a mobile app than through a browser. So when I say it's not, it's not an accessory anymore, I'm not just speaking metaphorically. It is now the plurality of how people get stuff done online, which is to say how they get stuff done. But the question is, what should an app be if it's going to be this? It's not going to be what apps used to be. Apps used to be like a white pages listing, where people would look up your company by name. And so you would do your marketing to build recognition of your brand, because when people wanted something that did what you did, they'd say, well, who does that? And look up the name in the white pages. And then someone said, well, we could do something really clever here. We could let you buy an ad in a classified directory. Remember before Yellow Pages was a thing? They called it a classified directory in places that didn't have that trademark. And the idea is, if you're a local provider, there might be a global chain that's got one in every city. If you're just in one city, you can buy an ad just as big in that one city's book. So now you could compete. The problem is that now people have to be assumed to be looking for your category. A new behavior surfaced a few years ago where people didn't Google for a company, didn't Google for a product category. They Googled a problem they needed solved. And it was up to you to make sure that you emerged not as a product, not as a vendor, but as a platform for solving that kind of problem. And if you didn't show up on the first page, you had a problem. And, and this is something I learned at this very conference last year, even if you show up on the first page of Google Hits, all that does is earn you the privilege of getting checked out with their network. And this is something I learned at this very conference last year that I think was Capgemini research that was pre presented here in cooperation with, with Center for Digital Business. Today, people do and therefore, can, uh, people can and therefore do go check you out with their LinkedIn network if it's a business purchase or their Twitter network or their Facebook network or their Pinterest network. And if the network doesn't vouch for you, doesn't matter how much brand awareness you've got. So you need to reconceive your offering in the marketplace, not as a portfolio of products, not as a portfolio of identifiable services, but as a portfolio of what problems do you solve? Now this changes people's conception of what their product is. I had this conversation with someone in agribusiness where he said, how do I do this stuff when my product is fertilizer? I said, step one, stop thinking your product is fertilizer. No one has ever aspired to own a bag of ammonium nitrate, no matter how pretty the wrapper is you put around it. It's not a, an object of desire. What they want, and I know farmers, I sleep with a farmer, and, and she says, I want profit per acre. She, she, they, they, you know, they don't buy any of this stuff because they want it. They buy it to get more productivity out of their scarce resource, which is their land. And if you can say, what, what we sell is agricultural productivity and profitability, well, now you're going to say, well, gee, we could you know, be pulling uh, Google local weather forecasts off of here, and we could be pulling logistics information off of here, and we can really turn ourselves into a portfolio of services anchored by the fact that you've already got a relationship with us because we deliver bags of ammonium nitrate to you whenever you need them. And it changes the question of what your app is. This is the Butterball app. You do not use it to buy a turkey. 
You use it to serve a killer Thanksgiving dinner. They're solving your, they're meeting your need, not merely pushing their product. This is the AAA app. Yes, you can renew your membership, but you can also get the tow when you need it. You're on the road, you can book the hotel room when you need it. They are your gateway to solving your problem before they are the obnoxious salesperson trying to sell you something. And platforms today have to be conceived in, in terms like you know, what you said. Where is someone with a need that's not met, and what do I need to do that's going to make me a complete solution to that need? An, an unusual solution, a, a solution they may never have thought could exist before. Of course, the next logical step is to stop thinking about apps on devices at all. And I think we're going to be hearing from the guy I'm quoting on this slide next, who said, it's about putting data in a context that makes it likely to change behavior. It's easy to forget that when Norbert Wiener first suggested that you could quantify information, that was viewed as a pretty dumb idea. Information was a fuzzy idea that took, you know, that, that was a state that happened in people's minds. And when he came up with the abstraction of the bit, and Claude Shannon you know, worked on that further, if, it may, if anything, they may have been too successful. Because now we treat information as if it has nothing but mass. And we forget that inform is a verb. And that informing people happens when you see that they are now doing something that they did not do before. And absent that, you have not informed them. You may have entertained them, you may have distracted them, you may have done a data dump on them, but you have not informed them. And so the question has to be, how do we really find the value in data? How do we see the stories in the data, which are about creating communities? And again, I realize I'm stealing all these great lines from things I heard this morning, but the, these, are, these are key principles. What's the community I'm going to create? What are the stories that are going to emerge? How do I turn these collections of data into relationships and opportunities that create new behavior? We've done an announcement very recently about a, a wearables initiative. It's not a walled garden. It had Google, it had Arm, it had Jawbone, it had Fit, it had uh, a, a Pebble, Samsung. We're all in this because we want as quickly as possible to get away from anything resembling fragmentation of this market. We want devices to be able to put data out there that people can add value to. And there was a question from the front row earlier for um, um, Blurb about making more people able to add value around your ideas. Our discipline now, as of uh, late last year, is that we have an ironclad rule. You can't do anything in any of our products that isn't just our serving suggestion on an API that anyone else could use to do it differently. We had an interesting conversation about this in June at the Business of APIs conference, where someone said, well, if all we are is APIs with our idea of a wrapper around them, then someone could download our software developer kit and clone our product. To which my response is, if, you want to be, if you're not going to be a moving target, you deserve to get hit. Business secrets of the Grateful Dead. Let the fans record the concert. Because it generates demand for attendance at the next performance. Well, you'll do something different. And if you're not prepared to put that pressure on yourself to be a continuously moving target, well, then it's like one of the tweets that's been showing up on that screen is, if you're not going to become a platform, if you're not going to play like a platform, then you kind of deserve to be shoved off the field by someone who is, who is willing to step up to that challenge. Data scientist was a job title that I'm not sure really existed more than a few years ago. Last year, the New York Times estimates it had an average starting salary of $90,000 a year US. And some people think it's just being a database administrator at petabyte or zettabyte or yottabyte scale. They are mistaken. Up here on the left is the things that some people think data science is. Data mining, data analysis, programming, algorithms, stats. I'm sorry, that's just going to get you in the door. Much more interesting are the implications it's going to have on changing how science is done. For example, we don't know why this is true. We don't know why people sending text messages through a particular cell tower are demonstrably, observably, 16 times more likely to be going to a place where they can catch and spread malaria. We don't know why. But knowing that it's true, we can target prevention and education efforts at a population that we know has high leverage. That's not the way science used to be done. Spend 20 years learning enough about the system that you can conjecture what might be an experiment worth doing, do the experiment with 9 tenths probability of failure to reject the null hypothesis. Everybody knows that's how you do science. Except that now, we can do it differently. 
I'm not going to call it the end of science, which was the apocalyptic title of the article in Wired, but it's certainly an opportunity to think differently about what science does, and Carolyn Bucky is an epidemiologist up the street at Harvard who says, this is the future of epidemiology. But there's the top right thing. If you're going to start curating this data from all these connected products about people's lifestyles, about their education, their health, all these things, boy, if you think people are touchy about financial information, if I make a billing error, I can make it good. If I ship your product to the wrong address, I can ship another one to your address. If I let the cat out of the bag on health, lifestyle, other personal data, it is not going to go back in. Anyone familiar with the term Streisand effect? Barbara wasn't happy about the Coastal Survey that put a picture of her backyard online, complained. Seven people had looked at it before. <laughs> There's a reason why Streisand Effect has a Wikipedia page. The act of attempting to mitigate disclosure of social information actually magnifies and intensifies the disclosure. So one of the absolute attributes that a platform should have today is robust protection of trust and identity. And this is one of the things that when we came to market with the Salesforce Wear Initiative, we said now you can think about the ergonomics and the technology of making a sensor small and transparent and fit into your, your um, life, and we'll worry about making sure that it plugs into a bus that knows how to handle identity protection and privilege management. That became a platform characteristic. And by the way, people are already discovering this is a real thing. A uh, healthcare chain paid someone to go survey the devices in the hospital, and he was able to establish not only was it really, really easy to get data off of devices, it was even easy to change it. So the science project stage of, hey, cool, look, we can connect this stuff. We'd better get past that really quick. We'd better start saying, well, wait a minute, what are the implications for people's lives and fortunes and sacred honor here? So customers are going to decide what a platform is. It's not a stack of stuff handed to you by a technology vendor. It's an open marketplace of services. Is it going to be cloudy? Sure, it's going to be cloudy. Is a Hilton Hotel have indoor plumbing? Can you imagine trying to build a hotel where everybody has to come downstairs and go out back? Couldn't do it. But I had someone ask me once, how do you monetize the cloud? And I said, do you think of Hilton as, as monetizing toilets? No, they're a necessary enabler. And once you've got them, you stop thinking about them. You stop talking about them. You start thinking about what kind of chandeliers do you want in the ballroom. Because now this is a level at which you can differentiate. And they're going to be consumed not by technologists. They're going to be consumed by power users and line of business experts. If you walk around your company, you will find applications that have been begging you to write them. It's just that you always thought you were going to have to call up coders and database administrators and buy servers to do it. And now you're going to just pull it off the line. You're going to create communities like the ones we've been hearing about this morning. Did you hear any of them talk about their capital budgeting for their servers? No. They just assumed that they were you know, in a breathable atmosphere of computation and data. And the question was, how do you add value to it? Um, so don't think about incremental improvement. This is the last Scott McNeely quote I'll use today. Don't design things that are merely better, faster, cheaper versions of what we have. Scott said once, why do we even want to think about a device at all? All I really want to do is carry something that proves who I am to the environment that I'm in and have it bring me the data that it knows I want and make available to me the functions that it knows I'm going to want to command. Now, if you begin from those zeros and infinities and then back off to what you can actually deliver today, at least you'll have an architecture that doesn't have to be completely discarded and replaced in three years. And that's my last thing that I want to share, is that build platforms today that won't look stupid three years from now, that might look a trifle ambitious, but that will absolutely be things that the technology will, will move toward enabling and making look smarter, because I guarantee you it's going to happen. Thank you very much for your time.